Um, so you can worship God with your giving. But I'm going to share with you today a woman that waited for the click. Her name was Anna the prophetess. We're talking about the four catalysts of the Christ child. And worship team, you can be dismissed. Thank you so much. And if you could just leave that playing, I'll love it just for a few moments. But I want to give you a little backdrop real quick as the ushers are coming to Anna. She was 84 years old. And she was, she, had, she was married probably around 14, 15 years old, which seems to be the average back then. And she was married for seven years and her husband died. Now imagine that. She's a 22-year-old young woman. No husband. And see, back then, the Jews took care of the widows by allowing the temple treasury to provide for them. And I don't know how they lived. I don't know the circumstances. Maybe Dr. Robinson would be more qualified to help answer that question. But it was their job to care for widows. And we talk about it. The Bible says true religion is this, to care for the widows. So there was this provision that widows got from the temple treasury, from the, the house of God. And they would do that. But if they were young, they were always encouraged to remarry. But see, Anna was young, probably 22, 25, in her 20s. And she decided not to remarry, but she decided to stay in the temple. And we'll pick up with that in a minute. But right now, you've got an opportunity to worship God with your giving. There are lots of things that can hinder you from hearing that click. Number one, stopping short. Being impatient. Disobedience. And see, the thing is, tithing and giving, it's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of faith. And... It's the base level of faith. It's just the base. It's, it's, it doesn't take great faith to give 10 cents on every dollar. It takes faith to go into difficult places and minister to hostile people. It takes faith to walk up to someone with cancer that's dying and lay hands on them and see that thing die in them and them live. That takes faith. Now, don't get me wrong. Everything takes faith, but... Some things are like on the first step, the basic. It's low risk, super low risk. We give money toward the goofiest things. Many of you probably saved for day after tomorrow all year. And what do you do? You blow it, probably a couple grand, some of you. Paper flies, everyone leaves. And next year, what do you do? You do the same thing again. Why? Because the stuff you did last year, nobody even cares about anymore. All that stuff our kids had to have. And see, we're talking about a renewable resource here. Something that never gets old. And I'm not, we don't buy God's favor. God's favor comes free. He loves you just because he made you. But there are things he will do for you in response to obedience that he will not do if you are disobedient. Does that make sense? He will not save you if you disobey his call to confess Jesus and believe on him. He wants to. He loves you. He wants ever. It says it's not his will that anybody should perish, but all that should come to the knowledge of God. But there are certain things that are attached to obedience. And there's something about finances. It's attached to your obedience. And look, I'm not saying that if you tithe, nothing will ever go wrong with your finances. Boy, is that not true. But there is a well in those moments that you can draw from. There is a confidence you have when the bank calls and says we're about to foreclose on your house or, or when the car breaks down, you don't have the $1,200 the mechanic asked for. There is a well you have to draw from and it's called faith. God, I have been faithful to do my part. So Lord, now I call upon you. Lord, this is not my problem because I've done all I can do. Lord, this is your problem. And y'all have heard me say this before. It's been a while. Daddy, sell a cow. Daddy, I need a cow. But Lord, I'm not asking you for a cow based on your goodness. I'm asking you for a cow based on your promise. And see, we need to know the difference between God's goodness and God's promise. God's goodness comes free. But God's promises are attached to obedience. Lord, you sent your word and healed my disease. That's why I believe in healing. And Lord, you said, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken, 
running over. Lord, I need your help. But if you don't put your part toward it, How many of y'all get frustrated at potlucks? When you see somebody bring three crock pots, and then somebody brings 85 people and brings a bag of chips. But then when it comes time to eat, they all up in your crock pot. Hey, act like I'm the only one. Right? And see, God is just. God's not going to let that happen. He's not going to give you access to something you're not a partner in. Are you hearing me? See, I'm nice. I'm going to let y'all eat my chili even though you brought 27 people and brought a bag of chips because I ain't God. And God will sometimes tolerate it for a season. But there comes a point to where when you're not putting in the pot, you'll starve. There's a difference between God's goodness and God's promises. We have to be partnerships. We have to take partnership with His promises. We have to obey. Salvation is a promise to those who confess Jesus. And God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But He'll let you perish. So with that said, it's an honor to give. It's an honor to be part of his kingdom. It's an honor to be a partner. It's an honor to know that when I am in trouble, I can say, God, I have been faithful to do my part. So I'm waiting for you to do. I'm not even going to worry. See, if you're worrying, that's a faith problem. Either that or it's an obedience problem. Because you know, if you haven't done your part, God is under no obligation. Now, he sometimes chooses to, to show mercy. God is a merciful God. But he also sometimes lets you This is God chastises his children in Hebrews. Sometimes he will let you go through the mess that you created. So here's my thought. Let's not create messes. We don't have to. Where where, where does this idea come? Oh, I've got to fail every day. Who said that? I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. Where did you read that? How about we walk in obedience? As soon as we make a, recognize a mistake, we correct that mistake. We don't wallow in it and live in it for years and claim mercy. We stand up, we dust ourselves off, and we say, you know what? That was stupid. God, I won't do that again. Lord, I want to obey you. What a powerful thing. Hallelujah. Christian, will you bless the offering in prayer? Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. All right. Well, I've sort of let the cat out of the bag because one thing they tell you in public speaking class is you tell them. Then you tell them what you told them. And then you tell them what to do about what you told them. So Beth always says, you repeat yourself. And it's like, well, I actually do it on purpose because sometimes I repeat myself because I forget. But um, in in preaching, I do not forget. I repeat myself because y'all forget. (laughs) You'll turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Verses 36 through 38. And the reason I decided to go this route with the four catalysts of the Christ child is because there are details we often overlook uh, with, with people, but we often overlook details, especially with those non-essential characters, or at least in our mind, not essential characters. You know, we think about Moses, or I'm sorry, Moses. I got Moses on the brain today, I guess. Um, we think about Joseph. We think about Mary. We think about the shepherds, and we think about the three wise men. And I tell you what, preachers ride those ponies every year. Right. And and I may get to that point, but I was praying. I said, Lord, give me something people haven't heard a lot before. And then those four came to mind. So, so far, we've talked about Mary's unquestioned faith. Right. So we start off with Mary and Mary is told by an angel, Gabriel, that you will have a child and you're going to call him Jesus. And and Mary's like, hold up. I never slept with anybody before. How is this possible? Then the angel said, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and overshadow you, and you're just going to have a baby by virtue of the Holy Spirit. And she said, okay. And pretty much, she said, let it be unto your servant as your word has spoken, which is the equivalent to the good old American, I, right? Okay, no problem. And then, of course, she gets to talk a whole lot. You ever notice that? 
Mary has a significant, she talks when Jesus is 12 years old, she talks, it's just like she talks, she talks, she talks, she talks, typical woman, just can't get her to hush, right? And then you have Joseph. And I'm going to see y'all again in two days, by the way. Merry Christmas. Uh, Then you have Joseph, right? Joseph, he is known for his unquestioned obedience. Right? He is given dreams and told what to do. And Moses, or I'm sorry, Moses, I got Moses. I must be supposed to talk about Moses. I got Moses stuck. Every time I say Joseph, Moses comes out. So Joseph did without delay everything he was supposed to do. Go to Egypt. Do this. Come out of Egypt. Everything that he was told to do, he did. Don't put this woman away. She ain't done nothing wrong. and He didn't do it. But Joseph never said a word. Amen. Typical man. Comes home. How was your day? Mm. Right? Yep. Typical man. Can't squeeze anything out of him. And, of course, I'm being silly because we, I'm sure that... that that Joseph spoke a lot. I'm sure that Mary didn't speak as much as the Bible makes it appear she did. Um, Then you have Anna. Now, in two days, on Christmas Day, we're going to talk about Simeon, and our Simon, Simeon. And uh, we'll we'll deal with him in a couple of days and uh, talk about what was special with him. But with Anna, starting with verse 36 of Luke chapter 2. You ready? It says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, which means a female prophet, by the way. So she was given the gift of prophecy. So she was able to foretell things, and she was able to see things because of the gift that was in her. The daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Baser. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. So in other words, seven years from the point that she was actually able to conceive, she had lived with a husband. Now, it doesn't say whether or not she had children, but it does say that her husband died. It says, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. Now, um, if you're like me and had to look up to remember what a four score was, it means 20 years. Okay, so that means she was about 84 years old. Now, listen to this. It says, which departed not? And I really want to hang on to that. Which, everybody say, which departed not? And there's a lot of us, we need to depart not. And it says, from the temple, but serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. She came in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Israel. And I want you to listen to that sentence again. She did a few things. Number one, she came in that instant. So in other words, when she came into the temple, this is what she would do. She would give thanks unto the Lord, and she would speak of him on behalf of all of those that looked for Jerusalem's redemption. So daily she went to the temple, and she said, Lord, I thank you. And Lord, along with all these other people that believe that one day you're going to send the Messiah, Lord, I am coming in this place, and I am praising you for that event that is coming. Every day. Every day, every day she would thank God. And every day she would speak about the coming Messiah and the people that were waiting for them. And this took place for over 70 years. You want to talk about some tension. You want to talk about somebody feeling wound all the way tight. Wondering when this click is going to happen. Wondering, is this event going to happen in my lifetime? Now see, Uh, Tuesday, we're going to talk about it a little different because, see, it doesn't say that Anna received a promise that this would happen in her life. It doesn't say that. We can't assume that. She may have just been praying and thinking she was going to pray till the day she died, having not even maybe realizing it in her life. But, see, Simeon, it's different because Simeon, it was promised that it would come in his life. So we'll talk about that Tuesday. But Anna was given no such promise, but she was faithful. It says that she went to the temple every day. Now it says, and fastings, prayer. Uh, now we can assume that she did not fast night and day every day. We got to use reasonable sense here. She would have starved to death within 70 years. So we know there were periods that she ate and there was periods that she fasted, but fasting and prayer was ex- an extreme part of Anna's expectation of the Messiah. 
And boy, isn't this a wonderful Christmas message. You need to pray and fast more. Isn't that what you expect to hear when you're about to go eat your Christmas turkey? And, and, and how about, Now, the thing is, I'm not talking constant. Now, she prayed every day. It says it. She did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. So we know that she prayed every day. And she may have fasted every day. She may have skipped a meal every day. We don't know what her regiment was. But we know what her agenda was, don't we? She wanted to see the Messiah come. She wanted to see Jerusalem redeemed. She dedicated the majority of her life to one purpose. Praying for the redemption of the people of Jerusalem. She took it seriously. The psalm said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. To the point that she dedicated her life to it. This was a special woman. And you know what I love about God is he doesn't only use men. Amen? He doesn't just use men. God uses women. And I know we get this weird sideways theology that we put women underfoot, but that's not where God drew them from. So why should we put them there? God drew them from our side. They can walk with us. They can partner with us and talk more than us. It is a scientific fact that women talk more than men. It is a scientific fact. I believe it's multiplied times more. And they say uh, that by the time a man gets home, the reason that's all he does is grunt is because he's out of words. He's used them all up. Poor the woman's still got about 40,000 left uh, in her day. Hey, I'm okay with getting in trouble. It's Christmas. Everybody's in a good mood Christmas time, aren't they? But she was faithful. She never gave up. For over 70 years, Anna did the same thing every single day. She prayed, went to the temple. Now, see, you want to know an interesting thing about the Jews and their relationship with the temple? Is that uh, you didn't have to go to the temple to pray. In order to pray, Dr. Robinson, what did they do? They prayed toward the temple. So Anna could have went and bought a house, and she could have prayed toward the temple. But the Lord told her to go to, remember, she was a prophetess. I mean, she heard the voice of God. And the Lord said, go to the temple every day. So she went to the temple every day. Every day she prayed. Maybe every day she fasted a meal or whatever. Maybe um, she fasted. And, but we don't know. But we know prayer and fasting was a part of her regiment because it is recorded. Every day she went to that temple, and every day she saw no result. Every day she'd go back to the widow quarters or wherever it was that they kept the widows or, or, or whatever it was that she lived in, and Jerusalem had not been redeemed. Does this sound like maybe some of your prayers? You've been praying and praying and praying and believing God and believing God and believing God. You hear the same story over and over again. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. But then we don't see the result. And I can imagine, see, Anna was a woman, which means she was a human, which means she had real feelings. And See, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that these people in the Bible didn't have real human emotions, didn't have real human doubts, didn't have real human struggles, but they didn't get to this point where they felt like giving up. But see, Jesus gave us the great example. He said, Lord, if this cup should pass from me, well, wouldn't that be great? But not my will, but yours. Even Jesus felt the intense pressure of his moment coming. And said, God, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours. And see, that's the attitude we should have. Is, Lord, if there's an easier path, <laughs> me, I'll take it. But, Lord, if there isn't, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me. The prince of it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, if this is the path that we got to take, then, Lord, here we go, as long as you're with me. See, there was a point where Moses, I finally get to get to Moses. This wasn't planned. God was so aggravated with the people of Israel. They had disobeyed, they had got the golden calf, and they kept making mistakes. And God told Moses, I tell you what, Moses, I got a deal for you. An offer you can't refuse. You go ahead and lead these people. You let them set you up as their leader. 
and I'll give you this land flowing with milk and honey. You just go ahead and go. Only one thing, I ain't going with you. And Moses said, that's not going to work. He offered Moses everything. Think about that. He said, you go ahead and go. I'll give you the land. He offered him everything. And Moses said, not without you. Not without you, Lord. If you don't go, then we stay. And the Lord said, so you have chosen the way of pain. No, he didn't say that. Um, (laughs) He didn't say that, but they were in the wilderness 40 years because they had to wait for those knuckleheads to die. Am I lying? They had to wait for all those knuckleheads to die. And then the next generation led them into the promised land. And we all know they were knuckleheads too, apparently, because... (laughs) I'm glad I got the ladies laughing now. That makes me feel a little better. What was the point of all that? Why did I even share any of that? Well, the point is there is something about faithfulness even when it's difficult. Because I think Anna, the prophetess, could have stayed home. She could have prayed toward the temple. But the Lord said, go to the temple. Because, see, there's, there's all kinds of ways to receive things from God. Right? You know unbelievers can tithe? And God will bless their businesses? But His presence isn't there. Amen? There are things that unbelievers can do they will receive because God's a God of principle. He's a God of order. But there's something special about a person that says, God, I don't want your benefits without your presence. So I'm going to be where you tell me to be. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm not going to accept any compromises. And that's what Anna was about. She's like, I'm not going to pray toward the temple. The Lord said for me to go to the temple. So that, that's the only way this makes sense. It had to be a command from God. Because otherwise it doesn't. Daniel prayed toward the temple. How many of y'all agree Daniel was a man of power and wisdom? He didn't go to the temple every day. This was a command given to Anna. And the thing is, why? It doesn't make sense. It don't make no kind of sense. But if you go a few verses later, we won't read it today, but Anna is doing her thing. She's in the temple, and guess what happens? Who gets presented? Jesus. Now, if she'd been praying from home, well, I tell you what, you're right. I, I didn't even know that sermon was in there, but we're about to preach now. <laughs> I love them surprise points when I'm even surprised how good it was. <laughs> For those of you watching on the stream, you better quit praying toward the temple. You better show up. Now, we know the Bible says we are the temple, which will be the immediate argument. But there's something about placement. There's something about being where you're supposed to be, right? There's something about being where God told you to be and doing what he said to do. And she went to that temple daily. And what if she'd have missed that day? What if she got discouraged and went on home? Now, would Jesus have not come? No, he'd have showed up. She would have missed it. She wouldn't have been there. And I wonder how many moments have happened where people missed it because they weren't there. They weren't where they were supposed to be. They were doing something else. They let an obstacle get in the way. Can I tell you a story? Somebody say no. Okay, I'm still going to. Um, I just wanted to let y'all know what would happen if somebody said no whenever I present that question. Figure maybe somebody was curious. Um, it was a Monday morning. And anybody that knows me knows Monday's my day off. I don't like to do anything on Monday. Nothing. Nada. Zero. Period. Nothing. I don't like to leave the house. Okay? I don't want to go outside. I don't care if it's 90 or 12. I don't want to go outside. I want to be inside my house. I want to do nothing. Okay, that's just what I want to do on Monday. If someone makes me do something, I'm irritated. I don't want to do anything. I want to stay home. That's what I want to do. But there's these monthly meetings that I'll be required to go to on occasion. And I didn't like them because they were on Monday. So I would struggle to go. And plus, I didn't really see their value in various things. And so there was this Monday meeting, and I wake up, and Beth says, you going to your meeting today? I was like, I don't want to. 
which was the same answer I gave her every time she asked. And I don't remember you saying anything in particular, but I remember you, uh, maybe it was something about community player or something, and I was like, <sighs> so I went to that meeting with an attitude. Sat in my chair and thought, we're going to do the same thing this month that we do every month. But see, there's something I had been praying. I said, Lord, give our living free, or our, uh, our restoration ministries, which is called now, back then we called it living free, uh, give our living free an opportunity to go before the court system so we can have people court appointed to that program. I've been praying that prayer. I was irritated. I didn't want to go to the meeting. I sit down, and there's this dude that shows up. And I could tell he's somebody by his voice of authority. And he's talking about these things that the churches are failing to do in the community. And I'm like, what a jerk. I'm serious. What a jerk. Coming here, lambasting the churches, talking about what they ain't doing. And then the Holy Spirit said, shut up and listen. So I shut up and listened. Turned out the man was Judge Hall. And as I listened to his story, my heart was gripped. And I went to him, and I said, Judge, I want in. Because he's talking about court systems and how people get caught in the system, and the churches, are, they have the message that can help them. But none of them are stepping up. So I went up to him, and I said, I want in. We had a meeting with our team. Do you know now that we have point, court appointed uh, parenting classes? We've had people court appointed through some of our living free classes, and weekly we meet with parents that have lost their children, and give them that hour window. And I almost didn't show up. I almost missed it. And I've been praying for it. You know, he's never been back since. He's never given that request again since. He was there for me. And I almost didn't show up. That's the importance of understanding your assignment and understanding the, appo the appointments that come with your assignment and meeting those appointments. Thank God for a wife that will rattle your cage and say, get to that meeting. Do what you're supposed to do. And I feel like there's so many of those that happened in our lives. How many opportunities are missed? How easy would it have been for Anna to miss her opportunity to not show up at the temple that particular day? I'm not feeling it today. I'm going to stay home. I mean, many of you all have heard of the Brownsville Revival? John Kilpatrick had lost his mother five weeks before the revival broke out. The day the revival broke out, Father's Day, 1995, he was suffering with depression. He picked up the phone to call one of his associates to tell them he was not coming to church that day. He was fed up. He had actually actively been looking and asking other districts whether or not there were church openings. When he picked up the phone, something pricked his heart and said, you're supposed to give a Father of the Year award away. And that little girl thinks the world of you. If somebody else was to give that away, she'd be devastated. So he got up with an attitude and went to church. And he said he thought this in his heart. I'm going to give that award away, and I'm done. I'm going to sit in my chair, and that's all I'm going to do. Brother Steve Hill is going to be preaching. I'm going to check out. And we all know what happened that day. If you stayed home, would revival have come to Brownsville? You better believe it would have. But he would have missed it. How many of us miss our moment because we don't show up? And this isn't about a coming to every service kind of message, although it would work real good to plug that in, but that's not my point today. Okay, uh, my point today is there are appointments God has with us. There is a time set aside that we are marked, and for us to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish, there is an intersection that has to happen. There are two points that have to meet. For me, it was myself and Judge Hall. For John Kilpatrick, it was himself and a Sunday morning. For Anna, it was herself and a temple prayer. That appointment had to be kept. 
So let me make my three quick points and let us, let's, let's, let's scoodoodle on out of here. There are people whose destinies are tied to this church. There are people whose purposes are locked up in this place. If you leave this place, your purpose will not be able to be accomplished in the intent that God had. Now, there are some people that are called to come here, receive, and go. I get that. But there are some people that are called to stay. J1L4. Jesus first, lakeside forever. I don't know how many people that is, but I do know there are people that are not here today that are supposed to be because of hurt feelings, because of frustrations, because of you name it, because of whatever. But the moment's going to come, and they're going to say, I should have been there. I can't believe I missed that. I can't believe I wasn't here for that. And the reason I preach the way I preach and think the way I think and do what I do is because I am hell-bent, for lack of a better term, on seeing this happen. I am determined to see. I am wound to my tightest point right now. You cannot get me any more cranked than I am cranked. So if you're looking for more crank, this is it. This is me. This is me cranked to the point of God. If you don't release me right now, the spring is going to bust. And the Spirit says, wait for the click. I ain't spending four hours a day in this sanctuary praying on Wednesdays and Thursdays and then half an hour on Wednesday nights and, and whenever else because I, I, I want to play tiddlywinks with Jesus. I am that way because God is winding me to a place when he releases me, I'm going to be able to do as much as possible as quickly as possible. You know what's interesting about some of these people whose destiny is tied with us that aren't here anymore? As many of them prayed with us, they were faithful with us, they believed God with us, and then something happened. That's the first thing. There are people whose destinies are tied to this church, and that includes some of you. Some of you will not accomplish what God has for your life unless you do it here. I know those are words that seem grand and crazy, but I'm telling you, if you go somewhere else, you're not going to be able to accomplish what God called you to accomplish. Now, again, there are some you're here to be filled up and you're here to go. I get that. We can't keep everybody. As a matter of fact, we're not have room for all of you. There's going to come a place where this thing's going to explode. We're going to have room for everybody. We're going to have to, and I'm not going to be seven service guy and then have to go to an hour service. That's not me. Okay, I'm going to be starting a new church guy and then that's where some of you may end up. I don't know. The thing is, I don't know what any of this looks like. That's why I feel crazy for preaching at halftime. But, but Paul said, if we seem crazy, we're crazy for the sake of Christ. So the first thing is, there are some of you, and you know it. You know it. When I preach this, it, it, it messes with you. It messes with your plans. It messes with your dreams. Pastor, don't talk about that again, because I've got a dream to go where the sunshine is. And where there is no winter, stop talking about that, and I'm not going to do it. I made the same commitment I expect of some people here. So just like Anna was supposed to be at the temple every day, there are some of you that are supposed to be here. I have made a long-term commitment. And guess what happens every time I make a long-term commitment? I get discouraged and be tempted to quit. Just being real. The joke is that pastors are excited every Friday and they want to resign every Monday. Okay, and the fact is it's emotional. There's ups and downs with it. And, and uh, the, the thing is, I was telling somebody, I can't remember who it was this morning, it doesn't matter how you feel, what matters is what you do. Because I feel some kind of way sometimes. Right? But see, I do what I know I'm supposed to do, regardless of how I feel. My feelings are not in charge. My faith is in charge. So I'm going to obey no matter how I feel. My feelings don't get to call the shots. Sometimes I feel a hot mess on Sunday mornings. But I get myself up, I throw on my suit, I get in my office, and I pray, and I find the presence of God, and I get up here and I preach the word no matter how I feel. Because that is my destiny, that is my purpose, and that is my calling. Some of you, there are things in the way of your destiny, there are relationships in the way of your destiny, there are 
opportunities in the way of your destiny that's keeping you from completely accomplishing everything God's called you to do. You can't give what you need to give because there are things in your path. It can be a person. It can be a family. It can be a job. It can be sports. It can be all. I could pick on all kinds of stuff. But the fact is, if you're there when you know you're supposed to be here, you're a prime candidate to miss your Judge Hall moment, to miss your Father's Day revival moment, to miss your Anna meets baby Jesus moment. It's a big thing to take home today. The second thing I want you to understand is there are souls that are depending on your prayers. Can I tell you that when you pray and fast with, ur- with urgency and earnestness, like Anna did, hell trembles, heaven rumbles, demons blush, and angels respond in war. I'm talking about prayer that shakes the foundations of hell, that rumbles the foundations of heaven, that make demons think, whoa and make angels think that's right. I'll never forget the dream I had where the angels were waiting in the sky. I don't know what they were standing on. I didn't see that much. But they were poised for war. And the Lord said, not yet. Wait for the church. Because the church wasn't ready. And it was talking about us. It's prayers like this that make a way where there is no way. It's prayers like this that make the impossible possible. It's prayers like this that will cause cancer to fall out of a body. It's prayers like this that will save a drug addict in the worst of their condition. It's prayers like this that will move mountains out of the way. It is prayers like this that will remove any obstacles. It's prayers like this that will keep us encouraged even when there's nothing to be encouraged about. It's prayers like this that will get us to the point to where there is such confidence in us that God will do what he's promised to do that nothing will deter us. But it takes prayer like that. Not God is good, God is great, let us thank you for our food. I mean, those are nice. And what is that thing we pray before bed? I haven't done it in so many years, I can't even remember. Yeah, now I lay me down and say, pray the Lord my soul to keep it up for a week. Oh, come on, people. Demons are hee-hee-ha-hawing over those kind of prayers. It's the kind of prayers when you get on your face and you say, God, it's me and you. We're talking. We're going to work through this. And Lord, I am with you. I am faithful. I am believing you. Lord, this is what your word says, and I will not let you go until it's accomplished in me. If it takes me 70 years of praying, Lord, I'm not going to faint. Those are the kind of prayers that heaven responds to and makes demons tremble. And that's the kind of prayer life Anna had. Pastor, why you always push this 6 a.m. Wednesday and Thursday? Because I know 6 a.m. is my best shot that the least amount of people are working. And here's the funny thing. If there was somebody that came and told me, Pastor, i got to be in at 6. But if you'll meet me at 5, I'm there. Guess who will be there meeting you? because I believe in it that much. I want every person to have an opportunity to pray like Anna prayed. And we may not be called to do it every day, but I do believe this will eventually be a 24-7 prayer station where people will take assignments and we will never be closed. There will be two and three people here throughout the day praying. I believe this will be an Anna-type church. What about that wayward child that God promised you he would save? What about that unbelieving parent that God told you to pray for? What about that impossible situation at work? What about that financial situation that just can't seem to, to, to see a way out of? What about that sickness and that disease you've been struggling with all your life? What about that prodigal that's out in riotous living? What about that situation where there seems to be no hope? Saints, I am telling you and I am calling you to pray and fast. Believe God. Shake the gates of heaven and see if they don't respond. But if you don't do it, your appointment can come and go. And you will miss it. Third thing I want you to understand is Satan wants you to give up at your nearest point of breakthrough. Why? Because you're tense. There is something about knowing that moment's coming but not knowing when it's coming 
that gets you wound. And as you know it's coming closer and you know you're getting closer to that place, there's something that builds inside of you. And you're begging to be released. You're begging to be turned loose. And the Spirit's like, not yet, not yet, not yet. And it's at that point when frustration can grow and then the enemy comes in. Has God really said? Did he really say he was going to save your child? Or did you just make that up? Some preacher or prophet spoke that into you. They were just having bad pizza that day. Because then he tries to get you to dishonor the word. Because what did Satan attack in the Garden of Eden? Did he attack the tree? He attacked the word. Because he knew if I can get them to dishonor God's word, hath God said, if I can get them to dishonor God's word, they dishonor God, and they are no longer candidates for the promise. Some of you may say, oh, the preacher said this, the preacher said that. Oh, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. You better be careful when you say that. You better be careful what comes out of your mouth. Because you may actually kill that which God is trying to accomplish in you. Motor mouth, motor mouth. Sometimes it's time to just hush. How many of you have been tempted to speak negatively about something going on in somebody else's life? Because it didn't look like the way you expected God to work. You remember the Rodney Howard Brown laughing, ha ha? How many people spoke negatively about that? People spoke negatively about the Brownsville revival. People spoke negatively about a lot of things. You can kill your moment with your mouth. That's just a side point, though. Satan wants you to give up at the nearest point of breakthrough. Can I ask you a question? What if Mary would have given up? What if she said, we're never going to see the Messiah? I'm moving to Egypt where the gold and the pastures are. This land is forsaken. What if Joseph would have said, I don't have enough faith to believe that baby was put in there by the Holy Spirit. So I'm walking away from this marriage. I know I had that dream, but I also had chicken wings. What if Anna would have said, I've been doing this for 70 years. I'm done. I quit. I'm tired. And then Tuesday, what if Simeon? And Simeon had something to say we're going to talk about. I'm going to read to you Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Are we all glad about that? Are we all glad when God says something, ain't nobody going to mock him. And if they do, they're going to look like fools. It says, for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you sow good stuff, you're going to reap good stuff. And he says that. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, which flesh is sinful nature. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes next. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let me ask you a couple questions. Are you to a point where you've been faithful? you're just about to give up. It's like, it's not working. It's not working. I've been praying for my kid. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I've been tithing. I've been giving. I've been, I've been working. I've been trying. And it's just, I ain't getting no better. Throw up my hands. Don't do it. Don't you dare quit now. I've been faithful to church every week and I haven't seen any kind of change. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. So many already have. There are people at home right now living below their promise or maybe even at another church living below their promise because they were tied here. Are you at a point where you know you need to be faithful but you haven't started? You know, I, I, I want to learn how to play piano. I ain't trying to spend no time doing it though. I mean, it's just going to have to come. There's a lot of us. We got the want tos. Lord, I want to do this. 
I want to get involved. I want to be more faithful. I want to do this. I want to do that. And then the alarm rings. And then we realize our want to isn't as big as we thought it was. Our obstacles are bigger. In other words, do you know there is more in you that God has called you to do, but you haven't done it? The time is now. What are you waiting for? And the third type of person I want to speak to is do you feel the pressure building? Do you get this sense? I don't know how to describe it. But it's almost like, Lord, if you don't do this now, I don't know how much longer I can hold out. If you're at that point, God is faithful. He's going to release you. He's going to allow you to accomplish that which He's called you to accomplish. And my instructions to you is wait for the click. Keep pressing. Keep building. Keep that pressure going. Do not, do not break resistance with that resistance. You wait for the click. God usually doesn't reveal the when. Look over in the Bible. He only reveals the what. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what my assignment is. It's the when. It's the when that keeps me all messed up. It's the wind that I don't know. So don't miss your appointment. Be there when your moment comes. Because folks, it will happen without you. And I don't want it to. God's will is going to be accomplished. I'm ask the ministers to come. We're going to pray real quick and then we're going to go home and contemplate about what we talked about today. But I'm going to ask again. Are you to a point where you've been faithful and you're to the point of giving up? Or are you to the point where you know what you need to do You know you need to be faithful, but you just haven't picked the ball up yet. You want to, want to, want to, want to. There's a whole lot of want to and not a whole lot of doing. The time is now. Do you feel the pressure building? Do you get that sense of, oh, it's so close, I can't stand it? It's kind of like Christmas Day to a child. It's like Disney World trip for a family build up that gets you there and it's just like the closer it gets the more tight you get about it the more anticipation and excitement you sense about it until it's time to be released I would love for us to pray for all three of you if that's you I want you to come you feel like giving up you feel like quitting I've been doing this too long it ain't working I know I need to do more I know I need to step up and I want to do that now. Or I feel this sense of pressure. I know breakthrough is near. And I want to stay on course. I feel like there's super glue in those seats. Come on. Just find somebody to pray with you. Need some ushers. If I get some music, that'd be fantastic. Any available musicians.
the rest of us, let's just intercede. This is not a spectator sport. It may help if we all stand. Even if you don't need prayer, maybe you can gather in this altar and create an atmosphere, a conduit for God to flow through. Father, use us today. Use us today. In the name of Jesus. 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 Jesus, we praise you, God. There's anybody that needs healing. If you need anything from God, I want you to come. Maybe you need financial breakthrough. Maybe you've got children that you're going to be seeing this week that don't know Jesus. Maybe some children are going to see parents this week that don't know Jesus. And you say, I want to receive it. And I want you to come. Hallelujah.
his portion and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes and if grace is a notion we're about that tension point when the car is cranked all the way to its highest point before the click that is where mistakes are most costly you let that thing go it goes off course that's why waiting for the click is so important I've seen young person after young person after young person get impatient with the call of God on their life and wreck all kinds of stuff. That's why I believe in young people. The funny thing is, the older I get, the older young people are. Also, the older I get, the older old gets. There is something about this generation coming up. Stay focused. Stay on task. They call you millennials and they make fun of you, but not me. So I'm about to release you. You give me 50, 20 year olds or people in their 20s. I'll take this town over. Won't stand a chance. I'm not dismissing the folks that have laid the way. I need you too. We need each other. We need the youth and vitality of the young. We need the age and the wisdom of the older. Let's get together and let's do this. Jesus. Next Sunday I'm preaching no looking back. Man, I'm excited. But I'm also excited for Christmas Day. 10.30. Simeon. Man, what a moment he had. To see the promise laid out before his eyes. Because Donnie and Debbie, it's something to believe something. But when you see it happen, you never forget. You never forget that when that stuff you've been talking about for 10 years, all of a sudden it happens. Man, I've had so many of those moments, I haven't forgotten any of them. And I want that for you. I don't know what Anna did after she met Jesus. Maybe she died. Maybe she lived on and stayed in the temple and prayed till there was another breakthrough. But she was recorded for a reason. Folks, I want that same spirit that was in her to be in me. Steadfast, won't give up. I hope when I'm 84, there's still another promise waiting for me. 
There's life in you. There's promise left in you. There's destiny left in you. You ain't too old. You ain't too old. Miss Pansy still has an appointment out in that foyer, passing out bulletins, changing lives. All the way down to the baby that's in the belly. Purpose. Send your right hands forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Wind us up, Lord. Everybody say that. Say, wind us up, Lord. And Lord, we'll wait for the clip. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. No services or any activities tonight. Go home. Enjoy your families. And I'll see you Tuesday.